Welcome to About Time, a new travel show segment for kids, where we voyage through time to connect with amazing women who have made history. I'm your host, Girl Friday, and today I'm lucky enough to have traveled back in time to speak to First Lady Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt served as First Lady while her husband, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was president from 1933 to 1945. Often called the First Lady of the World, Mrs. Roosevelt was the longest serving First Lady. She was also a political leader in her own right. She supported the Civil Rights Movement and helped establish the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. She actively published a newspaper column, traveled around the world speaking, and gave radio addresses throughout her life. We're so lucky to have Mrs. Roosevelt here today to chat. Welcome, Mrs. Roosevelt. Thank you very much. I am most um, flattered and honored to be here with you. I always love the opportunity to talk to women and especially the opportunity to talk to young people. So thank you for inviting me. So first, what I will do today is ask some questions um, for Mrs. Roosevelt to answer so we can get to know her better. And then we'll close with some advice questions for Mrs. Roosevelt from children who wrote into the show. So to begin, Mrs. Roosevelt, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Hmm. I had a very uh, unique childhood experience. I was blessed to be born into a family of, of um, wealth and, and, and privilege, and, and, and that certainly was a blessing. My parents were Anna and Elliot Roosevelt. We were the Oyster Bay Roosevelt, so my full name is Anna Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. My parents were always in the social circles and always going to parties, and I think perhaps my mother was the most beautiful woman that I've ever seen. So, you can imagine her disappointment when she took a look at me. When I was born, I was red and, and wrinkly, like a little prune, and, and my mother gave me the nickname of Granny. And she never called me anything else. And she told me, Granny, you will never be attractive, so you might as well learn good manners. In fact, very often, my own mother didn't even want to hold me. She would say, Granny, you go off into the corner there and you read a book. The only time that I was allowed to really become close to my mother was when she would get terrible headaches and she would invite me to come over where she'd be lying down on, on, the, on the sofa and I would massage her temples. And so from the time I was a very young child, I knew that my life was probably to be a life of service. Now my father never called me granny, he called me his beautiful little Nell. And he said, don't pay attention to what your mother calls you because if you have truth, and loyalty stamped upon your face, all the world will be attracted to you. You know, there were very many diseases then at that time for which there was no cure or no vaccine. And one of those diseases was diphtheria. And my mother and my little brother both passed from diphtheria when I was only eight years old. And I thought, well, my father will come and rescue me and, and take me away on his safaris and his trips with him. And, Yet that was not meant to be either, for he also had an accident when I was only 10 years old and he passed away. So at age 10, I didn't have my mother or my father. I went to live with a grandmother, Grandmother Hall. And she probably was unlike any grandmother that, that these children have ever seen or loved. For my grandmother was very strict and she lived in a dark old house with all the shutters always drawn and there was to be no talking and no laughter at dinner and certainly no toys. And she didn't send me to a school. She, she brought in a tutor for me. So I was always very lonely and, and, and I missed my father particularly. And when I would cry, she would say, just go in your room and close the door and cry alone. I don't want to see that. So as a child, I was, I was afraid of, of, of the dark. I was afraid of animals. I was afraid, I was afraid of other children because I had never had any friends. And most of all, I was afraid that there would be no one ever who would really, really care about me. So it was a privileged childhood, but a very dysfunctional childhood and a very lonely childhood. I'm so sorry to hear that it was a lonely childhood, but it sounds like 
the idea of having a life of service was very important and came out of that. Now, you mentioned, or I have at least read, that you were really influenced by a teacher. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that teacher and that experience? You know, there are many people who walk in and out of your life, but it is a true friend who lives a footprint on your heart. And Madame Sylvestre left her footprint on my heart. I didn't even go to school until I was 14 years old. And my grandmother then sent me all the way across the ocean to go to a boarding school in England. And I was terrified. I had never been around other students or other children, or I'd never been away from home. But Madame Sylvestre recognized in me a, a purity of heart. And what she said was the nobility of spirit. And you know she taught me that no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. No one can make you feel bad about yourself unless you let them. And she helped me to realize, she could sense that I was very unhappy, but she said, happiness is not a goal in itself. You can't make yourself be happy, but happiness can only be achieved by helping others, by serving others. Happiness is a byproduct of serving others. There was a tradition at a school where if you did a kindness, if you showed kindness to any one of the other girls at the school, they would acknowledge that kindness by leaving a flower in your dormitory room. And there were so many days when I returned from my classes to my dormitory room and that room would be filled with flowers. Those were truly the happiest days of my life at Allen's Wood in England with Madame Sylvestre. I still keep her, her portrait next to my bedside. I loved her so. So from a young age, you were connecting to people and you were trying to help them and make a difference. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role as a helper? I always wanted to make myself useful. I remember what my mother had told me about being useful and having good manners, and I especially remembered what Madame Sylvestre had told me about always being of service and helping people in need. And so when I returned to New York, because my grandmother had said it was time for me to, to come back to New York and, and, and to, to get a job or to get married, I went to all the parties and such that she wanted to see me at. But on the time that was my own, I made my way into the streets of New York. It was my father, too, who had taught me that we can't enjoy all of our riches or, or, or sumptuous meals knowing that there are people out there who are hungry. And, and so I would go into the streets of New York and see where I could be a service. And I taught classes to some of the children there and, and dance and art. And I joined several organizations that were, that were working to end child labor. Do you know that at that time there were very many children who were working in factories, working their fingers to the bone, and there were no laws to insist that they go to school? So I began working in all these other areas in the city. And when I was a young wife, and I married Franklin and had children. My mother-in-law, Sarah, took over all of the household duties and she took over all the child rearing. So to keep myself busy, I went out and saw where I could be useful. Again, Consumer League helping workers and, and the Red Cross helping people that had served in the war. So all my life, I've been trying to be useful. You've also had a lot of challenges throughout your life. The one that comes to mind is your husband's diagnosis with polio. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that challenge and how you dealt with it? I remember that day. It was a devastating day. Franklin was always a wonderful father. And we had four sons and one daughter. And we would go to vacation up near Canada. It was called Campobello. And we had a cottage there that was on a lake. And the president, well, he wasn't president then. He, he, he loved to play with the children in the water and, and, and sports and such. And he was frolicking in the lake at Campobello with, with the four sons. When suddenly he was overtaken by extreme pain in his arms and in his legs, and he was having trouble breathing. And the boys all pulled him out of the water, and we called in all the doctors, and no one could tell what was wrong with him, but he couldn't move. It took several days 
before he was finally diagnosed with infantile paralysis. Polio. Polio was another disease at that time for which there was no vaccine. We're thankful that there is a vaccine now, but at that time it was incurable. We had doctors and attendants help Franklin recover. So he was finally able to breathe and to regain the use of his arms. But it took very many years. And one of his advisors, because he was already interested in politics, told me, Mrs. Roosevelt, that while Franklin is recovering from polio, it is up to you to keep the Roosevelt name alive. There were so many people in this country that needed help, that needed assistance and support. People working in unsafe conditions, veterans who had come back from the war, women and minorities. And I said, I can't help keep the Roosevelt name alive. Everyone made fun of the way that I look, and they made fun of the way that I talk. And it was Louis Howe, another friend who left a footprint on my heart, who said, you have to always try to do what you think you cannot do. If there's a cause, or if there's a need, someone has to be brave enough to stand up and say what needs to be said. And so it was very difficult, but I did become the, the legs of Franklin while he recovered from polio. Even when he recovered enough to run for the presidency in 1932, he always needed a wheelchair. He never was able to walk again. And do you know that very many Americans were never even aware of how disabled he truly was? At that time, it was something that had to be hidden. So they always propped him up behind a podium when he spoke, or if someone had to carry him from his wheelchair to the podium, None of the newspapers would take pictures of that. You know, looking back, I think that if the public had known how sick he truly was, they would have admired him all the more for his courage and for his strength, rather than, than see it as a sign of weakness. So you recorded your thoughts and your views uh, quite a bit through a regular newspaper mm -hmm. column. Can you talk about how you use the media in your time period? Certainly, it, it did take me a while to figure that out. I was flattered at first that I was asked to write a column called My Day for the newspapers as First Lady. Everyone wanted to know what a First Lady does. But you know, I never wanted to be First Lady in the first place because all they wanted me to do was to, to look attractive, which I was never very good at, and stand on, on the arm of, of my husband, Franklin, and then also plan all the parties and all the events at the White House. And, I tried to write about those things, but I never believed that anyone should spend more than $10 on a dress. And in the newspapers, they were always making fun of the fact that I wore things without sleeves or that my dresses weren't, weren't, weren't glamorous enough. And parties, I, I, had no, I never planned a party before. I was a terrible cook. I only knew how to make scrambled eggs and they were rather disgusting and runny. And I never had any idea of what to do for a, for a party. So I'll tell you one quick story. As First Lady, the King and the Queen of England were going to come and visit at the White House, and everyone was all a flitter and wondering, what should we serve the King and Queen of England? And I had no idea. So I said, why don't we serve them something all American like hot dogs? And sure enough, when King Edward came with the Queen, we had a cookout, an all-American cookout, and the King had a hot dog set in front of him, and Franklin, said, Your Majesty, why are you picking up a knife and fork? And he said, well, I have no idea how to eat this thing. So Franklin told him, well, you just take the hot dog and you put it in front of your mouth and you shove, 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 shove until it's all gone. But soon I realized that there were more compelling things to write about in that column than fashion and parties. I realized that I had the opportunity as First Lady, and with this column that would reach thousands of people all over the country, maybe even millions, that I could be a voice for the oppressed. I wanted to make sure as First Lady that Franklin had a new deal when he was president, a deal that would help Americans get out of the Great Depression, but I wanted to make sure that the new deal was a good deal for everyone in this country, not just white men but for also women and young people and minorities 
who weren't enjoying any of the same rights that we were enjoying. So that newspaper column, My Day, gave me the opportunity to write about social issues in this country, the importance of getting children back in school, the importance of women having equal rights in this country, and the importance of civil rights, so that the rights that we enjoy as Americans extend to all colors and all races. So it became a very good voice to educate, particularly women who had just received the vote in, in the 1920s. It became a very good resource for them to educate themselves about what was truly important, the social issues that needed to be addressed in this country. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Maybe share a time when you had to stand up for something you believed in? Hmm. There was a wonderful opera singer, probably the greatest singer that this country has ever seen by the name of Marian Anderson. And she was a Negro woman and beautiful voice like an angel. And she was scheduled to give a concert at Constitution Hall. And there was a group of women there who ran all of the, the, the concerts and the, the events at this hall. And they got together and they decided, they said, there will not be a Negro woman singing at the Constitution Hall. And they canceled her concert. I was so outraged, I quit that group. And I arranged for Marian Anderson to sing her concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. to thousands of Americans of all races and all ages and all genders. And she sang, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. And I don't believe there was a dry eye in that entire audience. I quit that group of women and I ended up joining the NAACP the National Association for Colored People, and became very involved in civil rights. There was one other incident that I will share. One of my great friends, I was successful in, in establishing or convincing Franklin to establish a civil rights commission as president. And one of the advisors that he had hired was another beautiful woman of color, Mary Bethune, and we became dear friends. And we worked diligently together to improve civil rights for the people in this country. And there was a conference, a convention in Alabama in the South. And I attended this convention with my dear friend, Mary Bethune. And when we got to the, the conference hall where the meeting was to be held, there was a white side of attendees and there was a side for the Negroes. And Mary Bethune took her seat on the side that was designated for Negroes or colored or blacks. And they were ready to seat me in the front row on the white side as first lady and honored guest. And I could not sit down on the white side and I couldn't sit down on the black side so I stood there in the center of that aisle. And all of the men that were in charge of this convention were checking their watches and they were saying, Mrs. Roosevelt, you really must sit down. We have to get going. And I said, I will not sit down on the white side or the black side. And so I marched to the back of the hall and I found a folding chair. And I grabbed it and I dragged it all the way up to the front of that, of that hall and I plunked it right down in the center of both aisles and that is where I sat. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. They're very powerful. I think you always just have to do what you think you, you need to do. So, can we talk a little bit more about the role of First Lady? Because you don't actually have a job description and you don't even have a paycheck for the role of First Lady. Can you tell us what you did in your role as First Lady? You have to understand that one of the reasons I didn't want to be First Lady in the first place was because they really had very few roles to play and very few jobs to do. And I had become so busy while Franklin was recovering from, from the polio that I had already invested in so many different causes and had been on so many different commissions and committees. And as First Lady, I didn't want to give any of that up. Once I realized the great need in this country for reform, once I realized the great need in this country to guarantee human rights for every citizen, I became all the more impatient for those changes to happen. I always think I was kind of the lightning rod. I, I was the activist in the White House and, and 
Franklin was always the politician. He always said, we can't move that quickly. We have to slow down. And he was always worried about what everybody else in the rest of the country would think of him. He wanted all of their votes, so he didn't want to alienate any of the constituents by, by making social change too fast. But I couldn't make it fast enough. We did make great strides during those early years as we pulled the country out of a Great Depression. Franklin Roosevelt put men back to work with the WPA, the Works Projects, putting men, Americans, back to work building bridges and, and roads. But I made sure that they also put artists and writers and musicians back to work. And all around Cleveland, or even in anywhere in Ohio, in this whole great country, you see beautiful murals and, 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 and paintings and, and architecture that was funded by the programs that we established in the 1930s. During those years, half of, of adolescents in this country, teenagers, were neither in school nor did they have a job because there were no jobs to be found. So we founded the National Youth Organization to put students back in school where they belong. There were some people who said that was a communist idea, but it was just a human idea for me to put people back to work, people back to school, because young people are our future. We established Social Security so that people, as they get older, don't have to worry about their future. I made sure that women had equal rights. When I had a press conference, I only hired women reporters. And because I would only hire women reporters and journalists, more and more young women went into journalism when they attended college. But I'm most proud of the fact that we saw great gains in civil rights in this country during my years as First Lady that there was a civil rights commission, and we were able to, to enact anti-lynching laws so that, so that blacks in this country, especially in the South, wouldn't be terrorized and discriminated against. So I was very proud of, of taking a role that was very not at all typical for a first lady. What was the hardest part of being first lady? Hmm. The hardest part was I always say, when, when you see a need or, or an urgency or, or, or something that needs to be addressed, you should follow your heart. Because you'll be criticized anyway, no matter what you do. And it took me a while to actually be able to turn my back on the constant barrage of criticism. I had always, I've been called a great many wonderful things, as you introduced me, first lady of the world, or a great humanitarian, but I've been called some very nasty things as well. I've always been called ugly, or granny, or my grandmother who called me an ugly duckling. People have always made fun of the way that I look. Political cartoons in the newspaper would always print the most unflattering pictures of me. I've been called a loudmouth and a troublemaker. I've been called a pervert because I had friends that were, that were Negroes. I've been called so many names I couldn't even share with you, and that part was difficult. But what I learned is that it's is you don't let compliments and accolades affect you and, and, and make you proud. You also should not let insults or those kinds of criticisms affect you either. And so I was able to just turn my back on those things and, and continue to try to follow my heart. And that was difficult. And the other difficult thing was when I did get involved in social issues that were important in this country, that there was never enough time to get them all done. There was always so very much to do. And changes didn't happen quickly enough for me. We had started a, a society. I had dreamed of, of cities or uh, of towns or where a group of people could live together and be self-sustaining, where people would live together in a society where they all supported each other and they worked together and they grew their own food and they ran their own schools. And th those model communities, one was called Arthurdale, were very successful and welcomed at first, until there were people in the Congress who decided that it would be a perfect model community for whites only. And they became very panicky when, when the Negro population also wanted to enjoy some of those model communities. And then the entire, the entire idea collapsed. And that was disheartening. I also was very concerned and this is probably one of my most difficult roles as First Lady, was not making things happen quickly enough. 
that after the Great War, there were a great many refugees. Refugees that were left homeless without many family members after the Nazis had decimated Europe. And those refugees were, were looking for a new home. They were looking for a place where they could find solace and safety. And very many came on a, on a ship to the United States because their lives were threatened by, threatened by the Nazi party. And at that time in this country, there were very many people in government who did not want to deal with the refugees. And we actually turned them away. And that was a very sorrowful time for me as First Lady that I didn't have more influence than that to save those people who had already been through so much suffering. It sounds like you had a lot of challenges and you had to deal with a lot of criticism, but you also had a lot of great accomplishments. Can you tell me the accomplishment that you are the most proud of from your life? There is one that stands out. And I think it's interesting that it happened after my tenure as First Lady was over. You know, when, when Franklin Roosevelt died, just several months after being inaugurated for the fourth time as president, when I received the telegram that he had passed, I said, well, the story is over. There is nothing else for me to do. I'm no longer First Lady. But when the new president said to me, Mrs. Roosevelt, I'm so sorry for your loss. What can we do for you? I thought about that teacher, Madame Suvestra. I thought about my father. And I said, no, Mr. President, not what you can do for me, but what can I do for you? Because I realize that once you stop being of service, once you stop being useful, is truly when you begin to die inside. I think the new President Truman didn't really want to give me any kind of job because of my reputation. But he put me on a committee. The United Nations had just been formed after World War II. And he put me on a committee there where I think he thought I wouldn't cause any trouble or I wouldn't do any damage. And he put me on committee three, health, education, and welfare. And it is there that I think I was able to work on the project which I am most proud, drafting a universal declaration of human rights. And what that document stated, it addressed the situation of these refugees after the war. But it also addressed people that are in need all over the world. What it said was, it is not just Americans who are entitled to the rights of life and liberty and freedom from fear and freedom from pain, but those natural rights should be guaranteed to every single human being on this planet, not just Americans. And if we are a country, if you are a person who has the resources and the ability to help those populations or those individuals get those rights, it is our responsibility to do so. It was a difficult task ratifying the, the Declaration of Human Rights took years. There were very many countries who didn't want to recognize the fact of natural rights for everyone on this planet. But eventually it was ratified. And that is the day that I am most proud of, seeing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights signed by the United Nations. And you know, now that declaration stands as the basis for very many constitutions of, of new countries that are emerging. And I am so proud. What an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. We did have some children who wrote oh, in who I'm have delighted. questions for you, advice questions. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, you've done so many things to make a difference. I really want to make a difference too, but I'm a kid. What can I do? I can't vote. How can I help people? Sincerely, very vivacious volunteer to be. <laughs> I love that this child has that need to be of service or to make a difference. And I would just advise her to start with those people that are around you. Just as when I was in school, if you do something kind 
for someone else, even the smallest gesture, it will be noticed and you could make a difference in that person's life. And the second thing is to be able to stand up when you see someone else who is being bullied or who's being discriminated against or mistreated. To find your voice, no matter how shy and how scary that might be. Be a friend first to the people that write around you. That's a great answer. So here's our next question. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I'm very uncomfortable raising my hand or getting up in front of class to speak. I heard that you were very shy as a child and I'm curious how you got over your shyness. Do you have any tips for me? Sincerely, Shelly Shy. I certainly was shy as well, Shelly. And I think some of that was overcome when I, when I went to school and I received my education, but I still hated speaking in front of other people because so many times they made fun of me. But I remember when Louis Howe, the advisor to Franklin, who told me that I had to be the legs and the arms and the voice of Franklin while he was recovering from polio, told me that I was the one who was supposed to go and make the speeches for, for men that were working in coal mines what was dangerous or, or veterans who were in hospitals that weren't safe or for women or children in factories. And he said, you have to go and make those speeches now. And I said, I couldn't possibly do that. And he sat me down and he gave me this advice and he said, when you have something important to say or when you have the opportunity to be a voice for someone else who needs, you have to just stand up and you look to the back of the room and you say what needs to be said. And then you shut up and sit down. <laughs> That's what he told me. And I took that to heart. And certainly it was very difficult the first time I gave a speech. But every time after that, it became easier and easier because I knew I was making a difference. That's some great advice. So I have two more questions here. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I want to start a school newspaper and write my own column, but I'm having trouble coming up with ideas for what to write about. How do you come up with topics for your column? Do you have any writing tips or suggestions for me? Sign desperately seeking a byline. Hmm. I always enjoyed the most and felt the most passionate about writing about things in the column that were important to me. That's my, my most successful and well-read columns were probably the ones that were about social issues, not about the parties or the dresses or the food. So I wrote about things that were close to my heart. But I also took the time to find out what was in the hearts of those who would be my readers. I encouraged very much as First Lady, especially during the Depression, for people in this country, including children, to write to me and tell me what they were experiencing, what their hardships and what their challenges were. And they would come to me with stories that I, I couldn't even believe some of them because they were so heartbreaking and some of the struggles so insurmountable. But I read their letters. And when I could, I or some of my age would go and visit people who were living in conditions in Appalachia or, or in, in the slums and talk to them. And then I had all kinds of wonderful stories to share with the country, stories that, that very many citizens in this country didn't even know anything about at all and helped them to realize the need for social change. That's some great advice as well. I'm Thank really you. excited to see what all of the children watching decide to write. And if you are writing your own newspaper or newspaper column, please share it with us. Oh, that would be That's so here. delightful. That'd be so wonderful. So here is my very last question. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I struggle with people at school making fun of me because I get good grades and they call me a brainiac, but I also get criticized by my family when my grades aren't good enough. In your role as first lady, did you ever have to deal with people criticizing you and calling you names? Did you ever feel pulled in different directions? What should I do? Sincerely, Miss Smarty Pants. Well, as I've shared some stories already, I certainly have received a great deal of criticism. And I've experienced a lot of loneliness and certainly have felt pulled in very many directions as I tried to, to, to be a good mother and, and to be a, a, a wife and then to be someone who made a difference in the lives of all of those around me. So it, it was particularly difficult. And at those times, I think you just have to take the time then to look inward. And as I said earlier, do what you feel 
is right in your heart, to follow your heart. And you will be criticized anyway. There will always be someone who thinks you made the wrong decision or that it wasn't the best decision, no matter what you choose. But you always must do what you think you have to do. And somehow, somewhere, you do find the strength. We never turn a, away or, or, or a, aside from, from any of those challenges. You never see it as a fearsome thing. You have to look fear in the face and overcome it because your life is meant to be lived. And your life is lived to help someone else's to be of need and of service in any way that you can. Well, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, this has been a lovely time. I have so enjoyed getting to know you better mm -hmm. and hearing all of these wonderful stories and this wonderful and great advice you have for our children out watching us today. So I want to thank you. I thank you for this opportunity and I do hope that the children that are out there and the students that are out there will, will heed your call and, and write some letters of their own. It would be so wonderful to hear from them. Yes. and. We thank you for joining us for today's installment of About Time and tune in next time to see where I end up in women's history. Thank you so much for joining us.